thank you, James Hall, for being on Flute Unscripted. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for being on this episode. And everyone at Flute Center, myself included, is really excited to hear your performance coming up and your masterclass. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it too. It's been a while since I've gotten to New York, so I'm, I'm really <laughs> yeah. excited to come back. And uh, I want to talk about your journey a little bit to where you are today. Um, the, the path to becoming a university professor and soloist uh, is a tough one and kudos to you and it's different for everybody. So when you look back when you're studying at um, Seattle Pacific University and University of Missouri, did you always envision this life you have now or is the road here a little bit different than what you expected? Yeah, I, I mean, I always knew that this was a, a, a possible path that I could end up taking. But of course, like most um, college students, I, I really had no idea where I would end up. And I didn't know, um, I, I hadn't, I, I didn't really think about it um, on that, on those terms when I was an undergraduate. Um, I just wanted to play the flute. That's all I cared about. I wanted to play and I wanted to have a career doing it. And I didn't really care what that meant, um, honestly. Um, you had a very stage. open mind. <laughs> yeah, I did yeah. when I was an undergrad. Also, I went into undergrad not really having a clue what it meant. Um, so I learned as I was, you know, like most people do, um, going to college, I learned, oh, this is what people are doing. This is what, what it means to be a professional musician. Um, I feel like that's such an important part of the college experience as a music major is to actually figure out what it is that you're, yeah. you're going after. Um, because I think a lot of undergrads don't really know that. Some do. I think some um, from a very young age are sort of single-minded and have, have that, um, but I didn't. So. And so was that something, I mean, getting into a music program in your undergrad, was that a, a big leap for you? Were you kind of just like, well, let's see where this goes? Or um, was that in itself kind of unsure for you? Yeah, I wasn't sure when I when I auditioned for college, I wasn't sure I wanted to be a music major. Um, everyone was encouraging me to, to audition for the music school. And so of course I did. Um, and but I, I, you know, when I went into college, I didn't know if I wanted to be a music major, if I wanted to maybe study um, German, I was considering that. Um, I was going to say, what else were the possibilities? Yeah. <laughs> I was interested in in like marine biology when I was in high school. I was really um, I grew up in California, and so being by the ocean, I was always really interested in that. Uh, so when I went to college, I, I wasn't sure. Um, probably within before the end of my first semester of my freshman year, I knew it yeah. was going to be music. <laughs> and um, I now you're at the University of Northern Colorado. Uh, we've yeah. been there since two thousand nine. You won the position when they did a, a big nationwide search. So what was that process like? And why did the school feel like the right fit for you? Well, I think, um, you know, the fit thing goes both ways. Yeah. Any job, whether it's an orchestra job or a, a teaching position um, or a job working for an arts organization. I mean, you know, music majors can end up in so many different possible career paths. Um, but for a university, when you're the one teacher on an instrument, um, the fit really has to match exactly. It's like a puzzle. You know, there can't be any, it can't almost fit. It has to be an exact fit. Otherwise it just doesn't work. Um, and uh, so I think, you know, that, that bo goes both ways. And when in the interview process, it has to be clear to both parties. Um, I've seen it happen. I've, I've, I've experienced it myself where I interviewed and thought, oh, this, this felt great. I feel like I'd be a great fit, but they just didn't feel the same way. Um, and vice versa, um, where where I just didn't think it was it was great, and um, you know they were interested. So I think that 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 exact match is really really important, and and that's what happened. And do you feel like that finding that match is just something unknown, or this other element that can't really put be put on paper, or does it really come down to what you say your teaching philosophy is in your submission, uh, what you put on your CV, what you put in your cover letter. I mean, how much is it of each? Well, of course, those things matter. They yeah. matter tremendously. But I, I think that uh, the first mistake a lot of people make is to try to tailor their teaching or their the way they look to the school that they're trying to apply to. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't do your research or you shouldn't know where you're applying so that you that you um, do put your best foot forward. But I think um, that if you represent yourself in a way that's not 
authentic, um, it's not going to work out in the end. Um, either you're not going to get interviewed or, or get get the job after the interview because it's going to become clear to them, um, or you do get the job and things don't don't work because it doesn't. It's not a match. Um, so I think the the most important thing is to be authentically oneself um, and really represent who you are and show them who you are, um, and hopefully the, who you are is what they want. Um, and I think that that's that's always the better way to go in the end. What are some of the realities of professor life? It's not so glamorous sometimes, right? And uh, where do you find your inspiration for your teaching ideas? Um, can you talk a little bit about go-to studies, methods, and techniques for your students as well? Yeah, absolutely. I, I um, from day one, well, I got this from my teacher from, from graduate school at UMKC. Um, Mary Poses had a really rigorous scale requirement. Um, and she wasn't really particular about, I remember going um, to the start of my master's and, and saying, you know, what, what scale study should I work on? And she said, I don't care, just learn your scales. <laughs> um, she said, Taff and Bear, those are great. Uh, but, you know, there are, there are uh, endless scale and, and arpeggio exercises that we can use. But in the end, just make sure that you know them and make sure that you know them fully extended through the, the range of the instrument um, and that you know them backward and forward and you're not, you're not questioning yourself when, when playing them. And so her scale exam, she didn't specify um, exactly how to do them. She just wanted to make sure that we knew them. And it was the scariest part of the semester, every semester. Really? Was doing a scale exam. Oh yeah. Um, and everybody was just madly practicing for several weeks before the end of the semester for their scales. So I, I carried that with me because it, it really, um, my technique came so far during that period. Um, you know, every aspect of my playing improved um, as a result of that. And so I, I found that firsthand, I understood the importance of that and knew that I would carry that on to my students no matter where I was, whether it was in my private home studio or teaching someday in a, in a university. Um, so when I, when I got the job at uh, UNC, the first semester, I sat all the students down and I said, okay, look, this is what we're gonna do. And I've done it this way ever since. And much like my teacher, I don't um, specify, uh, you know, there's no magic study for me, um, but I do have all my students work out of Tafano and Gobert for sure. Um, and, and then learning their scales and their, their arpeggio studies full range from the from the start of their freshman year wow. um, and they they do a, a weekly um sort of scale class with my my graduate assistant where they're getting weekly practice at it so that by the end of the semester they're really prepared do you feel like it gives them a little bit um of personal responsibility to to not assign so many specific things and to say it's a little bit in your hands you have to figure it out Absolutely, you you hit the nail on the head. I think um, that all of the studies are good, so there's no um, there's no. I don't I don't really have a hierarchy, um, but oftentimes my students come and they say, "Well, I've I've I started working on this study with my teacher," and I say, "Okay, great, let's keep working on that one," yeah. um, because that way you know I'm not sort of mandating that they all buy a certain particular set of studies. Um, Usually they all get Tafano Gobert because you know that's a standard one that we all yes. know and 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 it's going to benefit them in the long run to have that. Um, but I usually tell them whatever they've been working on, great, let's work on it and let's make sure that they're right, that you're practicing them right, that you're learning them correctly, that you're you're really um, getting the most out of it. And then um, you kind of skipped over, maybe unintentionally. The, the hard parts of being a professor. Oh yeah. <laughs> I'm um, so I need to know. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, um, it's multifaceted. You know, there are it, both on the levels of, of the, the actual students and working with students, as I think anyone who teaches any student at any level knows, there are really, really rewarding things about it. And then there are things that are very difficult about it. Um, and and the COVID nineteen pandemic has really highlighted a lot of a lot of those things, both on both sides, the positives and the negatives. Um, so you know there are, as teachers, we deal with um, all of the ups and downs of our students. 
Um, and when you're working one on one with students, you know, week, week after week and for year after year, um, you really get to know them on a personal level. And so um, unlike a lot of college professors who don't necessarily know their students so personally, we as as teachers of these instruments get to know our students on a on a, a really close level. And so therefore, you know, there are good times and there are bad times with all students. Um, so I think that can be difficult when students are going through a hard time. You know, we as teachers, we feel that. Yeah. Um, when we're having a hard day, the students feel that from us. So, you know, we're all human. And I think that there's that human interaction element. Um, but beyond that, um, in terms of just working as a university professor, there are all kinds of things that, that we deal with, inter-faculty politics and yeah. dealing with budget issues of the universities, which we all, I think, are, are well aware of um, and have felt pretty acutely, especially recently. Um, you know, administrators who don't understand what it is that we do um, and trying to communicate the, the, the nuances of what we do to those people, um, that can be really challenging. Um, there's a lot of admin work. And I think a lot of people outside of academia and outside of the arts, you know, they think that, oh, we have such easy cushy jobs because we just teach, you know, X number of hours a week and that's all right, we have to do. Yeah. Yeah. And it's that age old thing that, that people think that teachers don't work that much. Um, they don't realize the endless number of hours that are piled on top of those teaching hours. Um, in addition to our own artistry and our own work as, as musicians, the practice that we have to do to keep our, to keep our playing up, um, let alone if we have concerts and things that we actually have to, to be preparing for and new music to learn and all of that. So it's, it's a, a tremendous amount of work um, that doesn't always show up on paper. Right. So that, that's, a, that's probably the biggest challenge, I think, for any university professor um, in music to have to kind of deal with. And then, I mean, you, you just talked about it, but outside performances, traveling, um, being on the road a lot, that can be pretty disruptive to a teaching schedule and to your own just regular personal life routine. Um, yeah. so is that hard for you to juggle? Do you feel like you're a little bit of a, a home buddy? Um, uh, yes and no. Um, my, my personal sort of, um, you know, I, I have a family and uh, we, we have, you know, we, we are traveling a lot just as a family in addition to um, what I do professionally. So um, yes, there has to be a balance. I mean, it was definitely easier, easier a number of years ago when I didn't have um, a family on top of all of this. Uh, I did a lot more of that kind of thing, just traveling, being gone and, and playing, but um, I'm still doing that a lot and, and I really enjoy it. It's, it's part of um, the, the job and the career that allows me to continue to be an artist and a musician and I need that. Um, so for me, it's important to prioritize that and make sure that I have time and energy to, to devote to that. But yes, it's, it's a challenge to balance all of that. Well, and what is practicing on the road like for you realistically? And do you have any tips for when you're away from home? Yeah, actually, um, I find that I, I get a little bit more practice when <laughs> I'm actually traveling. And, yeah, no distractions, um, right? <laughs> yeah, because because when I'm traveling somewhere, I'm in a hotel or whatever, and I, I, I might be able to carve out a couple of hours uh, that when I'm at home, you know, I've got a, I've got a one and a half year old and, you know, it's actually harder to, to, yes. to make sure I get practice time um, in that situation. But yeah, when I'm traveling, I, I can actually, nowadays I can get a little bit more done. And that's great usually because I'll have maybe a couple of days before a concert and a, and a class somewhere um, where I can just like really practice some things that, that I know are in there, but I need to yeah. kind of work them out right before the performance. So that, that happens a lot. You perform a lot with uh, your your duo partner and pianist Susie Maddox. Yeah. And you're in duo nine seven zero. So, um, how did you two connect in the first place, and how did you know that you'd be a really good fit together? Yeah, well, Susie and I go back to the to the very beginning of uh, my time at UNC. Actually, um, when I interviewed for the job, they hired Susie to come and play the recital with me. Oh, and so fun. I got there and, you know, when you, when you, you know, this is part of interviewing for a job that, that a lot of people, um, you know, if you're, if you've never interviewed for a, a college teaching position, this, it, it can be jarring when you just show up and you have no idea who this pianist is going to be. You have no idea what they're, you know, how they're playing is going to be. Usually it's somebody great, but 
you never know. And I got there and she was just this most fabulous pianist. She was so great. And um, when, I, when I first got there, I was actually already regularly playing with another pianist. So, um, you know, we immediately became friends. She was such a great collaborator and, and the recital went great. And then I got the job and, we, and so we remained friends. And she played a lot for my studio, for my students. Um, and she's just such a great musician and knows the flute repertoire so well. And, uh, you know, fast forward a few years and, and my relationship with my former pianist, we kind of went our separate ways um, just because of distance, uh, not living in the same area. It just yeah. became too hard to do that. So Susie and I decided to formalize our duo and, and became a duo. And it's just been great. We've, we've really enjoyed it. Um, what about working together, though, and navigating sometimes artistic disagreements, um, you know, being able to give constructive feedback and not take it personally when you are such close friends with your yeah. collaborators. Is that tough? I think it can be. Um, in our situation, um, we have such a great relationship and our personalities are such that we don't struggle with that. Um, we're both totally open to each other's ideas. Um, and if we don't like something, we just say it and it's not at all a problem. Um, but I have worked with people um, in other chamber settings and other pianists where that was maybe a little bit more of a sticking point. Um, and I think that the important thing is to, to for any musician, no matter who you are, um, no matter how famous you are uh, um, or not, <laughs> put, checking the ego at the door when you're working with another musician is so essential because ultimately we're in this together to make music. And if if we can't, listen to each other's ideas, um, it, it's just never gonna work. Both yeah. uh, from a from a, just a long-term standpoint, but also just musically. I've, I've seen performances where the musicians didn't get along very well, and that comes through a, a lot of the time. Um, yeah. It comes through in the performance, it comes through in the music making, there's a disconnect. And when people work really well together, you can see that. It just, it, it shows in the way that they play. And I, I can't tell you the number of times that after performance, performances, people have come up and they've said um, either, um, you, you know, you guys must have been playing together for a long time, it really mm -hmm. shows, or you guys must be really good friends, it really shows. I've had both of those comments so many times after performances, and it's because it's true. Yeah, um, it's we are great I friends. Can see that and hear that, you know, just yeah, yeah. together. Yeah, and you, were, you can you, you can also see when people are just really enjoying working together. Yes, and enjoying what they're doing on stage. Yeah. You yeah. two were recently, was it in Paris? Yep. Uh, does Paris have a special place in your heart? It does. So my husband is French, and so we spend a lot of time there. In fact, we have a, a place there um, that we spend oh. in the summers. And um, Susie and I actually gave our first uh, sort of li sort of first live performance since the pandemic, and oh. it was in Paris. And we did two world premieres of pieces that were written for us. And uh, we just it was just such a special performance for us because we we spent the last year and a half not being able to play together. Um, and so Susie was able to travel. We didn't even know if the concert was going to happen because they only oh. lifted travel restrictions um, a few uh, you know like a month before. Uh, so. We, we sort of planned the concert with the hopes, keeping our fingers crossed that we would actually be able to travel. Um, and, and in fact, she was able to, to travel to France and um, came and stayed for a couple of weeks. We were able to rehearse the pieces. We got two of the pieces. One of the pieces we got uh, about a week and a half before the concert. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, it's one of the pieces that we're gonna play. One of the premieres? Summer. Yeah, one of the premieres, yeah. Um, and so it's great, looking forward to playing it in New York too. Yeah. Um, and it's a wonderful piece, but we didn't, we had no idea um, what it was going to be like or how hard it was going to be or anything. Uh, so we got the piece a week before and we were able to really just focus in and, and work on it, learn it and, and rehearse it along with all of the other music that we were doing and, and had that concert there. A lot of your performances seem to have a theme um, that I've noticed in your duo uh, when you were in the Chamber Music Society of Kansas City and mm -hmm. when you go to the Loon Lake live summer concert series. There's mm -hmm. lots of small, intimate performances in unconventional settings, um, not yes. just on a big stage. So do you feel like that's where you feel at home in these smaller spaces, really connecting with the audience? Um, is there something that you think is lacking when you're at a big stage with a, with a big room? 
Um, I do feel at home in those intimate settings. I really, uh, I really enjoy connecting with audience members and connecting with people um, and being able to see their faces. And I think the big concert hall has it has its place. If I've if I've gone someplace and played a concerto with an orchestra, um, you know that's a totally appropriate place to do that. Um, but I've also done similar performances like that in smaller rooms where there were still a lot of people, but the people were a lot closer up because of the nature of the venue, and that's really cool too. So I think um, you know I, I don't know that I would say that something's lacking in the big concert hall, but I think that there's a place for that kind of setting and, and and a place for the more intimate setting and because i do a lot of chamber music playing and recital playing mm -hmm. i i really like that more intimate setting a lot um i feel really as you said i feel really at home in that in that setting i've it's also true. done chamber concerts on big concert stages yeah. where the audience is kind of in the dark and and that's not as fulfilling. That feels kind of weird yeah, <laughs> yeah. is yeah. there a most favorite place that you can think of um off the top of your head where you have had a performance Oh gosh. Um, well, probably back in my Kansas City days, um, the venue, sort of our, our go-to venue for a good number of years was in this really great oriental rug store. Oh, um, they, had, they had rugs from all around the world and art everywhere. It was just the, the curator, the, the owner of the store curated this collection um, that was just amazing. So it was sort of like a gallery, except that he was in the business of, of home decorating and um, the, the rugs that he, he procured from, from the Middle East and from Asia were just amazing and beautiful. And they were all over the store in various sort of, um, you, you know, laid out in various ways. Some of them kind of out on the floor and some of them folded up in ways that were really um, interesting and artistic. And so the venue looked really cool. And then it was in this old sort of warehouse building in the Crossroads neighborhood of Kansas City which is kind of the old um, where the railroad tracks are and, and kind of in, in that part of town. Um, and so it was a revitalized neighborhood um, that's now just really popular. And at that time, it was just sort of coming into being kind of cool. And uh, so it was a really great space to play in. The Sounds like the acoustics music. are probably good, right? <laughs> it was fantastic. Yeah, yeah, I think he had maybe unintentionally, he had balanced it with the rug so it wasn't so right. gloomy but it was just enough that it just had this great sound and the yeah. chamber music was perfect in there. And then did you take a rug home at all? To I, I did not. They were a <laughs> little out of my price range. <laughs> <laughs> like a good souvenir, yeah, but a pricey souvenir. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, thanks for, for being here. It was really great getting to know you a little bit more and I can't wait to hear you play. Thank you. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm, we're really excited to come and we're gonna, I should mention, we're premiering a couple of pieces by uh, one as a New York composer, Stephanie M. Boyd. Wonderful. Um, we're gonna be premiering uh, a work of, for flute and piano of hers, and then a colleague of mine, Paul Elwood, um, who composed a piece for us this, this past summer. Great, I love it. Thank you again. Thank you. All right, bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>